Hello everyone and welcome to Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. Today we're going to have part two of our series on the North American A3J A5 Vigilante. In part one, which has a link uh, below the title block, we covered the evolution of the North American aircraft from the T-28 Trojan into the Jet Age, the FJ Fury, which opened the door to the Navy, and the attack uh, mission of the original A3J-1. And then uh, we're going to discuss today where that all went. The A3J as an attack airplane fell a bit short. We'll talk about why. And uh, it emerged into a new role, much like the F-105 in uh, Southeast Asia, took on a whole new life. I should mention that you're going to want to watch till the very end because we have a surprise for you that is going to knock your socks off. We have a one-of-a-kind, never-before-seen factory model of a variation of the A3J that you will not believe. I should mention that the A3J and its sister airplane in terms of development, the F-4 Phantom, both came along in 1958. And this is significant because it represents the next step after the initial Mach 1 Century Series airplanes or for the Navy, the F-11 Tiger, the uh, Vought F-8 Crusader. And so by taking the mission profile to Mach 2, the Vigilante represented a whole new capability for carrier-based Navy aircraft. And let's see where that went in terms of ev evolution of the airplane. As I mentioned, the first flight of the A3J-1 at Columbus, Ohio took place in August of 1958. Why did the Vigilante come to be? The Navy attack aircraft at that time, or up until that time, uh, consisted of the Douglas A-4 Skyhawk, the Grumman A-6 Intruder, which was uh, coming into being, and a little later on the Vought A-7 Corsair II. What those three airplanes had in common is they were subsonic. Excellent airplanes in their own right at each uh, uh, point in time, but the Navy took the Vigilante uh, to bring the attack role into the supersonic age. The idea is that after a low, fast entry into the target area and a pop-up maneuver, the store would eject from the tail. It was deemed uh, not as successful as the basic attack profile uh, with the subsonic airplanes, and so the A3J roll uh, went by the wayside. However, uh, the airplane changed dramatically. We're going to see some of the uh, evolutionary changes to the airframe. But these two factory models, which are both made out of resin, represent the initial design. It's even got the very cool uh, North American Vigilante logo on the nose. If you built the Ravel or the monogram kits, they both had that. Uh, so it was a significant machine. You notice it's a two-place airplane. You had a naval aviator pilot in the front seat and a naval flight officer, WIZO, or weapon system operator, uh, in the back seat. Let's take a look at what became of the original A3J design and see where it wound up in history. Have you ever heard of an NA-247 Retaliator? I hadn't, but you're looking at it. What this beautiful resin model represents is an aircraft manufacturer proposing a Navy airplane to the Air Force. This was done many times, most notably with the McDonnell F-4 Phantom and the Vought A-7 Corsair II. But what we have here is the Retaliator uh, offered as uh, the original airframe uh, in an Air Force role. Uh, I will mention that uh, this approach of a Navy airplane proposed to the Air Force is as recent as the T-45 Goshawk when McDonnell Douglas proposed it as an Air Force trainer as you see in this rendering of the airplane flying over Air Training Command headquarters at Randolph Air Force Base, Texas. The model you see here is designated RA-5C but there's a couple of twists. What made the RA-5C different than the A3J? There's a couple of things. Number one, you notice the, the famous hump uh, emanating in the turtle deck behind the uh, second canopy along the dorsal spine. And this housed a fuel tank for extra range. But what's interesting is on the bottom of the airplane, you see the camera pod here, which contained cameras, sensors, and all sorts of, at that time, advanced equipment for photo recon and uh, sensing missions. What's interesting about this particular model, it's in navy colors, but it's uh, a bare metal finish, and you notice that it's carrying external stores. So this was kind of the last gasp, an attempt at the Vigilante uh, as a, an attack airplane. You see a bomb load on the internal hard points and a Shrike-like anti-radiation missile on the uh, outer pylons, but this was a proposal for the uh, Mach 2 A3J RA-5 to be used in the attack role, and again, a bare metal finish, a very interesting model. It did not go into production, but let's take a look at the one that did, and this is the airplane that put the Vigilante on the map. We just talked about a number of proposals that did not go into production and did not see operational service. 
This is the airplane that changed the game. Designated RA-5C, A-5 for the new designation post-1962 for the Vigilante, R for reconnaissance, C for latest model. Here's the machine that put the Vigilante into naval aviation history. What you see here is the Photo Recon Mach 2 carrier-based RA-5C configured with four 400-gallon external fuel tanks for extra range. Range was a critical component of this airplane's mission in Southeast Asia. The carriers were in the Gulf of Tonkin. It had to cover a tremendous amount of uh, distance to get to a target and back again. There were tankers outbound, going uh, feet dry, coming back feet wet, tankers back to the carrier, all the above. But the RA-5C brought the long-range, high-speed photo mission to the Navy. 167 vigilantes total, a number of them converted to RA-5C, uh, and used uh, throughout the Southeast Asian conflict. At the end of that war, that mission was uh, no longer needed, and so the RA-5C wound up uh, into the history books. But this is the model that represents the final configuration. Notice uh, a couple of unique touches here, too. The feathered edge for the trailing edge white. Uh, the uh, vertical stabilizer was all white, and again, an all-flying control surface. Really a stunning, stunning factory model in resin of the RA-5C and how the Vigilante looked as it flew in operation from the carriers in the 1960s. I promised a big surprise at the end of this program and you're looking at it. This is the NA-349. NA-349, what is that? It was a proposal to the United States Air Force Air Defense Command for the ultimate interceptor. What you see on this model, painted in bare metal finish, the model itself is a high gloss flat aluminum finish, is a two-seat boosted three-engine version of the RA-5C. You'll notice on the bottom there are six Hughes AIM-54 Phoenix missiles. These missiles had a range of 120 miles and the airplane, like the F-14 Tomcat that came a bit later, could fire all six missiles at once and hit six simultaneous targets. So it represented a huge advance over the F-106 uh, and the earlier interceptors that came before. It would have been a mammoth machine in operation, but like so many aircraft at this time period, we're talking late 1960s, it was uh, maybe a little too much for the mission uh, at that point. So as you can see, the NA-349 is basically a vigilante on steroids. It was a North American Rockwell aircraft proposed to the Air Force in the late 1960s. And by the early 1970s, you had the Grumman F-14 Tomcat coming online, and that is the airplane that eclipsed this. With its variable geometry wings and a number of other advanced systems, the F-14 took this idea to the next level for the Navy as a carrier-based airplane. However, it can't be denied that this is one of the most unique, one-of-a-kind models probably ever produced from the North American model shop, and it represents the epitome, the zenith of the vigilante as an interceptor proposed to the United States Air Force. So there you have it, a look at the North American A3J A5 Vigilante with these beautiful models from the North American Factory Model Shop in Columbus, Ohio. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat, and until next time, take care.